Good day to everyone, and we all hope that you're enjoying the virtual platform of the 15th conference on SEDEVAS. It is the greatest pleasure to introduce the invited plenary lecturer of Professor Brian Bat Mathieson, who we have with us today. Bat Mathieson is a professor in energy planning and renewable energy systems at Aalborg University. With a PhD reaching to future energy systems, his research focuses on technological and socioeconomic transitions to renewables, energy storage, large-scale renewable energy integration, and the design of 100% renewable energy systems. He is one of the leading researchers behind the concepts of smart energy systems and electrofuels, taking place among highly cited researchers since 2015 as the top 1% among cited, most cited researchers globally, according to the Clarivate Web of Science. Among many other positions, he is a member of the EU Commission Expert Group on Electricity Interconnection Targets in the EU. In addition, as research coordinator of the Sustainable Energy Planning Research Group, he has been actively involved in more than 60 research projects and is directing the master's program in sustainable cities at Aalborg University. He's an editorial board member, associate editor, and editor of numerous journals, and an editor-in-chief of the newly launched El Selvia journal, Smart Energy. Furthermore, he's an active member of the Danish Academy of Technical Sciences and a board member at the Danish Energy Technology Development and Demonstration Program. Brian, who is also an International Scientific Committee member of the Stevas Center, has supported Stevas from the beginning and represents the highest ideals of this research community by pioneering actively towards impact and integration. Let us all give a warm welcome to Brian for his invited keynote presentation. Brian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sir Gilgis, and thank you very much for those kind words. And thank you for inviting me here to speak today uh, at the online uh, Stavis conference, uh, which uh, uh, was supposed to have been in Cologne. I am uh, sitting here in a, a, a high school in Denmark, where I've just been talking about how to reach the 70% uh, reduction target in, uh, in the Danish society and uh, I have been so lucky uh, uh, as well to, uh, to borrow a room here where I will be broadcasting from for the next 45 minutes. Um, I hope you will uh, have uh, a lot of questions. I've been looking very much forward to meeting you all. Um, my speech today is about the latest developments in the Danish society and um, uh, it is concerned with the 70% reduction targets uh, of greenhouse gas emissions in the Danish society. Now, this target was, uh, was set by a new government that was uh, put in place uh, just above a year ago. And during that time, uh, I and my colleagues at Olbo University, uh, together with the Danish Engineering Society, have created a roadmap uh, to show uh, what technologies are necessary and what is the possibility to reach uh, the 70% uh, reduction uh, target of greenhouse gas emissions. So this is going to be the main uh, parts of my, my talk. I will also relate some of the things that uh, we have been doing here uh, to the European context, uh, especially uh, with regards to energy efficiency in buildings and the current debate on hydrogen and power to X. Again, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I'm very happy to, uh, to be here. Let's see if I can... Last year, we had uh, an election in Denmark. And as we have seen throughout uh, Europe, uh, we can name this a uh, climate election. Climate was not the only topic, but it was certainly one of the main topics, which it had not been uh, before. As part of this, uh, the many parties that were running, we actually had 10, were competing about what kind of targets should we have in 2030. And after the election had taken place, the coalition decided that we should have 70% uh, reduction targets for 2030. As the new government was put in uh, to, to place and these agreements were 
uh, settled, all of the parties in the Danish parliament agreed uh, to uh, support this target. So the 70% reduction target is set in stone. It is set in a climate law uh, that has taken effect and it is supported by all members of the Danish parliament. So this is not a left-wing or right-wing situation. This is a, a, a very stable uh, situation. This situation brings us quite a few challenges. On this slide here, I uh, have shown you from a, a Danish uh, a governmental publication what the development has been since, since 1990 and what the expected development is if we do nothing more until uh, 2030. The reduction until now has been a little over, uh, a, a little on, under 1 million tons of CO2 reductions per year. We have about 10 years to reach the 70% reduction target. And that actually means that we need uh, to uh, triple or quadruple our level of CO2 reductions per year. This is not an easy target. This is not an easy uh, uh, thing to achieve. And I think it is clear to everybody in the Danish society that we need to pull on all of the measures uh, possible. The graph you see here uh, represents uh, the emissions that we have. The bottom one is transport. The next one is agriculture. Um, then we have others, which is the gray one that is sort of process industry. Then we have households and the big gray one is uh, businesses and industry. So oil and natural gas and coal and industry. And the top one, the black one, that is um, electricity and district heating. And you see the, the target is the little yellow dot uh, on the end. The target uh, means that we have to do something in all sectors. My talk here will be on electricity, heating, in industrial uh, energy consumption, and on the transport part. Um, we have in our, our work uh, taken into consideration changes that needs to, to happen in the agricultural sector as well but those inputs we have taken from the agricultural sector themselves. Oh, I think I'll just, as, as part of the work uh, or the debate here in Denmark, there has been set down what, what we call climate uh, partnerships. In total, the prime minister set down 13 climate partnerships uh, going from finance uh, to heavy industry to electricity, uh, sub, uh, heating uh, sectors on heavy transport, light duty, duty transport, uh, small businesses, etc. This has been part of a process where a lot of suggestions have been made on how to achieve the 70% reduction target. But it has also meant that not only citizens that have uh, uh, participated in the election, but now also businesses are more committed to actually making changes. Um, if we look at the Danish uh, situation, we can see that we can actually almost cover all of our current primary energy supply with wind power. Of course, this is not uh, doable and uh, we need to consider other energy vectors as well. And here uh, I have listed the potential uh, renewable energy sources. You can see our uh, biomass uh, potential is around 200 petajoules. We have uh, uh, also photovoltaics. Then we have a lot of potentials uh, within uh, the heating sector, especially that has to be used in, in district heating. Here we have geothermal, solar thermal, industrial excess heat uh, data centers and, uh, and heat pumps. The challenge is, uh, can we make energy efficiency improvements 
uh, and can we create a system where we use these uh, resources most effectively. I and my fellow researchers uh, together with the Engineering Society have been uh, putting out plans since 2006. The first uh, renewable energy plan in Denmark came in December 2006 and we published that together with the Engineering Association. Since then we have published four reports and it's the latest report that I will come into in a minute. During that, uh, we have uh, implemented all our, our latest research into those uh, scenarios that we are putting forward into the uh, debate about how to create this societal change. Um, the latest uh, report that we have done is, uh, is called EDES. Klimasvar, it means uh, the Engineering Association's answers to the climate challenge. Um, the report as such reaches until 2030 and deals with the 70% reduction target. This report builds upon another uh, report we did five years ago, which is called EDA's Energy Vision, in which we uh, made a fully renewable energy scenario for 2050. The principles in both of these reports are based on our smart energy system approach. This means that we try to exploit the synergies that we have between the energy carriers. We need to use the electricity system and expand the uh, electricity consumption to replace uh, less efficient internal combustion engines, for example, and to uh, enable that we can use cheap renewable energy from PV and, and, uh, and wind power. We also need to connect this to the thermal grids. We need uh, the district heating grid and in the future district cooling grids as well uh, in order to efficiently integrate uh, renewables on a larger scale. Also, uh, the gas and liquid fuel systems are important uh, in order to exploit the cheaper energy carriers and the cheaper storages that we can have in uh, these uh, sectors. EDA's Climate Answers is also uh, constructed in a way where we try to actually achieve 100% renewable energy five years before we initially uh, proposed in 2006. In other words, we're currently working on a follow-up report uh, to illustrate how we can reach climate neutrality five years before the 2050 target. This is also in order to uh, make sure that we are able to meet the Paris Agreement targets and that we can cover uh, the reductions that we need to do in the Danish society to meet um, uh, to meet the reductions and to reach the maximum 1, 1. 1.5 to 2 degree uh, temperature change. For the 2030, uh, excuse me, for the 2030 uh, plan uh, that I will be talking about now, this means that the choice of technologies that we are having in 2030 should not hinder that we can reach uh, the full climate neutrality or 100% renewable energy system in 2045, it should actually enable us to do that. We need to also, towards 2030, focus on developing new technologies that we need post-2030 in order to achieve the next targets. I will come back to what kind of technologies that is. We see the Danish society as part of a greater European context. This also means that we believe that the UN accounting method is not sufficient for us to deal with. We need to account for international uh, aviation and navigation uh, in order to make sure that we're covering the reductions in all of the sectors 
concerned with the Danish society. We also believe that it's important that we have a, uh, an ambition to stay within a sustainable level of biomass consumption. We cannot create an energy system that it goes beyond what is uh, possible per capita to consume uh, in Denmark, because then that would hinder other societies in Europe and globally to reach the same targets. So we need to stay within a sustainable level of biomass consumption. It's also important for us to consider how we are part of the European energy system, namely that we are able to flexibly integrate our renewable energy, uh, but also that we are able to preserve uh, security of supply and have reserve, uh, reserve capacity, uh, mainly in the electricity grid, uh, to support the situation where uh, we do not have any renewable energy sources producing. So we see EDIS climate answers as a part of the European uh, context. Here are the results. The, uh, the work that we have done is divided in uh, to, to different sectors. And as I showed you on the first graph, we're mainly con considering the energy and industrial sectors. What you can see here is that from today, 2020, uh, we are reducing the energy related greenhouse gas emissions uh, from about 30 million tons to 11 million tons in 2030. When we have the full picture and when we're using the UN method, which is a method where we do not include international uh, aviation and navigation, um, we can here see the, the full picture. And the full picture requires also that we have a 30% reduction in the agricultural sector, which is, more the, which is less than the agricultural sector themselves has said is achievable in the climate partnerships that I mentioned uh, for you before. In other words, the results that I'm showing you here are able uh, to meet the targets that we have uh, set out in society uh, by uh, 2030. If we zoom in to uh, this energy part, those 30 million tons per year that we are emitting right now, we can uh, see that this is divided into uh, different parts. And in the report and in the presentation here, I will try to go into these different parts uh, one by one. As you see, the current system uh, is really very much dominated by uh, emissions from transport. Transport is the dark horse in Denmark, but in most countries all over the world where we have not done enough and where efforts are gradually starting with baby steps. This means that right now we are emitting more than we did uh, 10 years ago in the transport sector. Uh, and we have seen an increase in the last five years that is rather steep. That, that accounts for 12.4 million tons. If we look at industry, this is mainly the input of natural gas, oil and coal for uh, the industrial sector. We can see we are using, uh, we are emitting 7.8 uh, million tons of CO2 equivalents per year. And when we look at heating and electricity, you see that that is actually less than transport uh, combined. This is of course connected to the fact that we have already decarbonized the electricity and heating sector quite uh, significantly. We have now 50% wind power in the electricity grid and we have replaced a rather a large amount of uh, coal with bioenergy in the combined heat and power sector. I will come back uh, to these elements later on. In uh, the 
EDIS uh, climate answers scenarios that, that we have created, we have reduced uh, the greenhouse gas emissions in transport uh, by about four point uh, of, of by about uh, four uh, four point eight uh, million tons per year, and you see the that we're down to seven point eight million tons per year uh, in two thousand and thirty. The remaining part here is uh, uh, a large part of aviation, a large part of trucks. Uh, but actually, the significant part is uh, 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 light duty vehicles and personal vehicles, where we're not able to uh, decarbonize all of that by 2030. If you look at industry, we have decarbonized uh, about uh, one, uh, uh, about three fourths of the emissions today. And you can see that for heating and electricity, we have next to nothing left uh, in, in carbon emissions in 2030. This is uh, the diagram as it looks today. And uh, this is uh, uh, what, you, what you see in the middle is all of the fossil fuels, the coal and the oil and the natural gas going in and a lot of that going to transport and industry, but also partly going to electricity and, and heating. And on the top, you see the current situation with wind power, where we are covering uh, uh, around 50% uh, at the moment. If we compare that to our system uh, in 2030 that we're proposing, you can see that uh, Ninety-nine percent of the electricity is coming from renewable energy sources, and that wind power is more than doubled in in 2030. And you can also see that coal and oil and natural gas is now a very very limited part, uh, and is mainly uh, delivering uh, towards the uh, the transport and industrial sectors in 2030. You can also see if you compare the two different Sankey diagrams that we have a completely redesigned energy system where we are using this smart energy systems approach that I will come a bit more into in a minute. The method that we have used to create the scenarios are that we have considered the four sectors, heating, industry, transport and electricity. And then we have divided that into some uh, subjects. One of the subjects is energy efficiency. Another subject is sector integration. Another subject is biomass. Another subject is renewable energy. And the last subject is technological challenges. And I will go through each of those now. Uh, for, for energy efficiency, we are trying to uh, enable a situation where we, uh, of course, reach the 70% reduction targets, but where we also uh, use uh, cost-effective balances between energy savings and renewable energy. And here we have uh, considered a lot of uh, past research into how to do that. Uh, for heating, for example, we need to insulate our buildings uh, around 30 to 40 percent uh, compared to today. Um, we can uh, create a situation where we have energy savings of what we call, or electricity savings in what we call the traditional electricity consumption. We can have energy savings in industry. We can convert from mainly natural gas to district heating. And outside our natural gas uh, areas, we can convert to individual heat pumps. Also for transport, we can create a situation where we have a lower growth in the uh, mobility needs uh, in order to, uh, to have uh, an, a more energy efficient system. If we do uh, what we have proposed here, which is technologically and economically possible, 
uh, we can have the savings that are equivalent to the Danish responsibility in EU's energy efficiency directive. And actually, this is a debate we're trying to drive here in Denmark, where the focus on the energy efficiency directive seems, seems to have been lost in translation. Um, EDA's climate answers also uses uh, sector integration. Oh, I, there was one thing I wanted to mention here, sorry. Uh, as you see on point four here, that then we're converting uh, how, more houses to district heating. And some of you that know the Danish system will know that we already have uh, more than 50% of our heat demands covered with district heating. So you may wonder why we expand it, but we do expand it to those areas where we have natural gas. The natural gas grids have been, been uh, set out in areas where the energy density is equivalent to what we normally have in district heating areas, which means that anywhere in Europe where you have natural gas, it is more than likely that it will be possible to expand the district heating uh, grid in those areas. And in a Danish system, it is uh, feasible and also energy efficient to have even more district heating than we have today. Of course, this has to be combined with the heat savings so that we can create a situation where we have lower supply temperatures and where we use the concepts of what we call fourth generation district heating. We also look at sector integration. EDA's climate answers provide synergies and flexibility. Uh, we have uh, integrated large uh, thermal energy storages where we can integrate geothermal, solar thermal, industrial waste heat, waste heat from power to X and electrofuels, and also use large scale heat pumps in order to balance uh, the entire system. We're exploiting existing uh, natural gas caverns and we're building new hydrogen storages uh, of uh, both of them, a total uh, storage of 40 gigawatt hours. The latest research, by the way, is uh, pointing to the direction that we should actually limit hydrogen storage and maybe store our gases in, uh, in other uh, ways uh, because the hydrogen storages are actually uh, rather ex uh, expensive. Um, but that is actually research that, that we have done after we published this report. Over capacity of electrolysis plants is needed, 50% utilization time. Um, it, it seems to be forgotten sometimes that if you have a thermal storage and use a large scale heat pump, or if you have an electrolysis plant as part of a smart energy system, then uh, in order to use a storage, and to use the flexibility, you need a capacity where you're able to flexibly operate that uh, in accordance to when the renewable energy production is there. This seems to also be forgotten sometimes, but for the overall economy, this is actually not a, a, a big issue. It is not a problem. For the individual investor, it can be a problem. And of course, we need incentives in that matter to be able to, uh, to uh, to have this overcapacity. We also need that for large scale heat pump and electric boilers. When we look at batteries, uh, we need to use batteries uh, in the electric vehicles and they should charge when we have uh, a lot of renewable energy in our grid. Uh, we are not implementing things like vehicle to grid or grid balancing uh, batteries in uh, this plan. Here, we, we, we don't believe that it is needed on a larger scale. Flexible electricity demand is also uh, implemented to a small extent, uh, and there may be some of the conventional demand that you can have uh, flexible, but this is a, a rather small uh, part. When we look at transport, uh, we have shown here that in the longer run, not in 2030, but in the longer run, 100% uh, renewable in transport, renewable energy in transport is possible. We can have a growth in mobility, but we need to have 
more growth in the efficient, uh, more efficient public transport and less growth in the road transport. Uh, one uh, or eight, uh, eight electric vehicles are better and more energy efficient than 10 electric vehicles. We need to have modal shift, uh, so towards uh, more efficient uh, transport and direct electricity consumption and where we have uh, light duty vehicles and buses, but also coming up more and more trucks that have shorter ranges, uh, we need to indirectly use uh, electricity in our batteries. One of the things that we have a lot of focus on is electrofuels. You see here a diagram of electrofuels uh, and uh, what we do here is we take some electricity from renewable energy, uh, create hydrogen, combine that with uh, carbon from gasified biomass or from point sources. And here we're then able to create an electrofuel, which could be methane, it could be uh, DME, uh, dimethyl ether, or it could be ammonia. Uh, th in that case, you would need um, nitrogen. Uh, we can also create methane and, and gases. There's a current debate about what kind of fuels it is that we need in this future energy system and what kind of heavy duty transport uh, fuels we need. And more and more of our research are pointing clearly uh, towards the liquids and mainly towards methanol, DME uh, and ammonia. When we look at biodiesel, biogas, bioethanol, these are really uh, only able to cover small niches of transport. Math and physics rule them out uh, as a broader concept uh, to use. This level of detail is, is not what we see in the current debate in the European Union uh, regarding, uh, the, regarding hydrogen or regarding the long-term uh, scenarios that have been put forward in the report called A Clean Planet for All. In EDA's climate answers, we're reducing the biomass consumption from a business as usual, and uh, we're reducing it from around 29 gigajoules per capita to 26 gigajoules per capita. We need to convert that in order to stay in a sustainable level compared to the global availability of bioenergy, but also we need it in order to uh, be sure that uh, other countries are able to do the same. Um, there's a lot of uh, different reports out there about bioenergy. Today, uh, we believe that uh, in the Danish con uh, context, we have around 30, maybe 35 gigajoules per capita. The latest EU research shows that if we look at only residual resources uh, and rule out food or rule out energy crops, then we may have around 17 gigajoules per capita. In the new or relatively new EU scenarios in the report, A Clean Planet for All, the level of biomass consumption is 15 to 21 gigajoules per capita on the European content, uh, cont, uh, continent. But this is also connected to a continuous use of some sort of fossil fuels uh, to support uh, the, uh, the energy systems. In the longer term, we have shown previously in 100% renewable energy in 2050 that we are able to stay within these 30 uh, gigajoules per capita. This is a, a focus that we need to, to keep uh, in the future. In EDA's climate answers, we're expanding the level of renewable energy using more solar thermal in district heating and in individual buildings, using geothermal for district heating, using photovoltaics, mainly on large roofs, industrial roofs or parking lots, not greenfield projects or small house, household level uh, PV systems. You need more wind power onshore, which is the cheapest form of electricity we can have. We need to uh, triple at least triple or quadruple our offshore wind power by 2030. 
And then we're proposing also to keep a focus on developing wave power as that could have a potential uh, after uh, 2030. I will just talk a little about how the debate is in Europe at the moment. Um, in the report called A Clean Planet for All, we see that there's a, a large variety of scenarios. However, only two of these are actually meeting the net zero emission targets that we need to commit to. Uh, also, we can see that as opposed to previously, there's more details in buildings and industry. Scenarios have a lot of problems, however. There's a uh, seems to be a politically driven focus on gas and both natural gas and hydrogen, which is forced in a lot of places where it does not make uh, sense. There's a claim to make optimal systems, which I don't believe that I can do or the, that these scenarios are showing. Also, there's much too high a degree of ambition on energy efficiency in buildings. I believe we do have to have ambitions here, but it is not possible to the extent that the Commission is um, uh, is proposing. Also, there's no expansion of district heating in the scenarios. There are some tool problems which are creating some of these issues. There, uh, there are five five year time steps. Uh, the modeling is uh, uh, partial equilibrium modeling, which simulates uh, energy markets in a way where you're not able to radically change your investments. The investments are put out by the assumptions you're making as a user, and this creates problems in your creativity, in your ability to redesign the energy system. Here you have the scenarios that uh, were put out in, uh, in, the, uh, in the report, A Clean Planet for All. The scenarios uh, are driven by the greenhouse gas reductions. The main energy carriers are electricity, hydrogen, that's quite a bit of power to X. Um, we have greenhouse gas emissions that drive very big energy efficiency targets. And we have a focus in some of them on, um, on circular economy, economy. The two net zero emission uh, scenarios are combining the different other scenarios in order to have uh, a possibility to meet the 1.5 degree targets. These, tar these scenarios are, are called uh, 1.5 tech and 1.5 life. Some of the problems in those scenarios that we see is that there's a very large focus on um, storing energy in batteries. And I believe it is important to store energy in batteries, but the purpose should not be to put electricity back onto the grid. Also, we see that there's a focus on creating hydrogen to then create electricity back onto the grid. And here we have losses of 40 to, uh, 50, 40 to 50% of the, the, the wind power of EV electricity that we put in. This creates quite a large a loss and expands the cost of your overall system. The scenarios that we have created in uh, Denmark that I have gone through previously now, but also that we have done in previous years have a significantly different focus on energy storages compared to the European Commission scenarios from primes here. We can also see that the, uh, the share of energy carriers in the final energy consumption reveals a number of issues. There's a focus on e-liquids and e-gases. There's a focus on um, hydrogen. And uh, if you combine this, this is actually quite a lot of the energy or the final energy demand that is covered with these. But it is not clear uh, to what extent and how these gases are, uh, are produced. And 
it is also clear that the way they are used are not very efficient. I will come into that in a minute. When you look at the overall picture, you can see that half of the consumption is electricity. This is in compliance with, uh, with uh, the, the research that, that we have been uh, conducting. But you also see that there's a continuous use of uh, fossil fuels uh, and, uh, and that the way that you're keeping within the, the sustainable biomass consumption is actually that you're assuming that we can create e-liquids, hydrogen, um, e-gases without further expanding the use of bioenergy. And, uh, and this may be, be uh, problematic uh, in the future. If we look at buildings, uh, for example, here's, here's what you see of, 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 of problems in some of the scenarios. And uh, here, in, in those scenarios that, that in, in all of the scenarios, there's a very high use of gas for, for heating, there's a stagnating district heating, there's an extremely high ambition of uh, energy efficiency, and this is also connected to quite substantially higher costs than today. Here you see the uh, non-electricity fuel that is used in buildings. And if you look at, for example, the power to X scenario, you see that e-gases, whatever that may be, uh, is used to heat buildings. In the hydrogen scenario, you see that hydrogen is used to heat buildings. So this means that this is then carried on into the combo scenario and the 1.5 tech, 1.5 live scenarios. This creates a situation where you in the system design have to have renewable energy sources where you can create uh, this hydrogen. And then you have to imagine a situation where quite a number of households in Europe and, and businesses will be able to pay the upstream cost of the electricity grid, the hydrogen storages, the hydrogen production of electrolysis, as well as the wind turbines. And this is where we need to create some, some new scenarios where we show that this can be done in a cheaper and more cost efficient as well as more energy efficient way. We also see a very high ambition on space heating in buildings. And I believe we do have to have quite substantial energy savings in buildings. But the level that is proposed here is more than halving the current uh, heat, heat demand in buildings and this is for sure uh, not very pragmatic and not uh, possible to reach. I believe that the 2030 target is a very high ambition on its own and if we can reach that by 2030 that is, uh, is a very very uh, good and, and, and also uh, uh, safe uh, and doable uh, target to have. When we look at the system costs, uh, there are some strange things in the EU scenarios that happens. But the general trend is that the, let's say the lowest hanging fruit from 2020 or 2015 to 2030. And then from 2030, you can see a variety of cost developments uh, from the uh, from the different uh, scenarios. The reason behind these increased costs are uh, uh, very high costs on, uh, on uh, refurbishing buildings, but it is also connected to high costs uh, due to the energy system design that has been proposed. Some of the costs are not possible to account for when we start to look into the numbers. But in general, we can see that the scenarios uh, show a situation where we have around 70% higher cost for our energy system compared to today. This is not in conjunction with what we have, for example, here in EDA's climate answers. In EDA's climate answers, you can see that 
we actually have the possibility to have the same costs in 2030 compared to today uh, if we are using a smart energy system approach and using an approach where we are considering a balanced uh, energy saving, energy efficiency approach with new storages and using all of the grids. You can also see that the cost uh, distribution changes from a rather high cost on energy uh, consumption to high cost on investments. The uh, 160 billion Danish krona per year, which is the cost of the 2030 system, uh, is equivalent uh, to around 20, 22 uh, billion uh, euros per year and includes both the energy, uh, both the electricity, heating and transport uh, sectors. So we have here included vehicles as well. You can also see here a list of the largest investments in the period from 2020 uh, to 2030. And we have in investments of around uh, 515 billion Danish kroner or around 80 billion uh, euros. The top one is building renovation. We have onshore and offshore wind, electric vehicles, industrial in, individual heat pump, industrial savings and electrification. We have district heating expansion and fourth generation district heating. We have photovoltaics, biogas, new gas fired uh, uh, power plants and CHP plants, large heat pumps for district heating, electrolysis and hydrogen storage, geothermal wave power gasification, charging stands, intelligent infrastructure for transport, flexible electricity demand, solar heating, surplus heat and, su and thermal storages, district cooling and gas grids. And these are the largest investments. So there's a number of things that we can do. All of these are more or less off the shelf technologies. If we look at the known technologies, these are actually what I have just gone through. So as an example, we can expand the EV and, and, and the EV infrastructure. We can uh, further integrate uh, renewable energy by having thermal storages and, and solar thermal uh, plants installed. We can utilize surplus heat from industry. We can insulate our houses. We can put up PV and onshore and offshore wind. These are possible off the shelf infrastructures. We can create more public transport and use more urban planning to have a better mobility. So these are the known technologies that are vital for achieving the 70% reduction target. There are also partially known uh, and partly new technologies which, must be, which, which we must develop and which is also important in 2030. And these are an upscaling of large heat pumps in district heating uh, together with industrial waste heat. It is large scale heat storages, it's geothermal energy, its conversion to fourth generation district heating is a utilization of surplus heat from data centers and electrolysis. It's an intensive energy efficiency in industry. It's replacing coal and oil and electricity with bio and biomass in industry. It's electrolysis plant that operate flexibly and are operating maybe only 50% of the time. It is uh, hydrogen and gas storages. It's an integrated electrofuel production with carbon capture. And uh, it's a flexible operation of the existing biomass fired combined heat and power plants. We have things like road pricing we need to further develop. And of course, on a larger scale, we need to intelligently um, charge EVs. So these are actually partly well known, but also partly new. Uh, technologies that we must develop in the course of the next uh, 10 years and implement uh, also partly in 2030. We also have a number of new technologies that we need, especially because we need them after 2030. These is a wildcard like e-roads for trucks. Um, it's more efficient electrolysis with solid oxide electrolysis uh, cells further develop large-scale electrolysis uh, with 
in integrated electrofuel product production. It's uh, electrofuels including carbon capture. Large scale thermal gasification is extremely important to create flexibility, but also to have an efficient carbon source. And then we have um, also a large scale uh, straw in uh, biogas as a, as, as a good uh, way to go with that. Um, intense upscaling of electrofuels for aircraft and aviation. And then we have also a uh, wave power as, as a new technology. I think that uh, concludes my, my keynote here. I hope you have enjoyed the travel from uh, the election last year in Denmark and throughout the next 10 years in Denmark and the perspectives uh, going also into the European energy system. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, for the excellent presentation. I think we all received a view of how the smart energy system has given the answer to the climate crisis in Denmark for redesigning the energy system and possibly showing the way to address shortcomings in existing scenarios for Europe and beyond. And uh, I would like to now um, open the floor for questions. And we have our first question from uh, Nevin Duich. And uh, if you would like, uh, we, we may receive your question uh, live. The question starts uh, by mentioning that it takes around 20 years to electri electrify transport. Denmark did not really start yet. In 2019, market share of electric vehicles was only 3%, while share of total registered electric vehicle was only 0.5%. When do you expect that phase in on electric vehicles will start? Is there time for having planned impact in 2030? Thank you, Nevin, for that question. And you're completely right, transport is a is a dark horse here. Um, I can reveal that the latest statistics says that 20% of the vehicles sold so far this year is electric vehicles or hybrid plug-in vehicles. And also I can say that uh, this Monday, next Monday, the 7th of September, a commission report is coming out on changed taxation of electric vehicles. So I'm expecting that we will have a kickstart of, of this within the coming year. But of course, it remains to be seen whether we can reach the target. We are actually proposing to have uh, around 1 million electric vehicles in our plan. And, and that, of course, requires a very high acceleration. Uh, Brian, I would like to ask one question. Um, all the principles that you mentioned for uh, Ida's uh, vision are also very much supporting and uh, uh, possibly uh, pioneered uh, to shape the EU strategy for energy system integration. Uh, how do you see this as an opportunity um, for implementing the smart energy approach across Europe? Well, I, I, there's always a lot of debate. What can a small country do? to change anything and our emissions do not really matter that much and that's completely true i think what we can what we can try and do is to to show how the how we're able to technically do this how we're able to create um, markets and ownership structures where we're able to redesign our energy system to reach the 70 percent target and i think that if we're if we're focused enough on doing the transition cost effectively, then this can also be replicated in other places. When I travel around Europe, I travel as a researcher and not as a Danish business person. So I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not really promoting any, anything else than, than uh, the research and systems that we have. And I think that by doing things and by showing it's possible, then I think also that others, other countries, not only in Europe, but globally can be inspired to, to do some of the same things. I'm very concerned about the debate uh, and the new uh, hydrogen strategy that has come out from the Commission. It is very focused on using hydrogen as the end, uh, as the end uh, source, and it is not promoting innovation uh, where I think it's needed, namely in hydrogen combined with uh, carbon 
uh, and uh, nitrogen to create some of the more complex fuels that is needed in heavy duty transport. So I'm rather worried about this gas debate and the hydrogen debate in Europe, where we're not focused on the complex systems, but we're actually focused on using hydrogen to, to heat houses. And we have one question for from Hervoye. Yeah. May we unmute the microphone, please? Yeah, I did. Thank you, Shir. Uh, I wrote it down also, but uh, thank you for your nice presentation, Brian. So uh, my, can you comment on the use of alternative fuels, uh, the electrofuels in the international shipping, in the shipping sector? The IMO has made a 50% CO2 emission reduction for this sector until 2035. And one Danish company, Man Energy Solutions, it's a big producer of large IC engines for ships, is making a big push for the use of ammonia in this sector. However, the industry and all the other uh, ship operators and everything, they are saying that this fuel has not been researched still enough. Yeah. Thank you for that question. It's, uh, it is true that the IMO has somehow uh, been, been awakened. And I, I know a, a person who is very strongly connected to IMO who, who says that, that this has not been an easy process. But uh, the commitment within uh, the shipping industry is actually rather high and they know they have to change. Uh, one of the possible fuels is ammonia. Another one is another electrofuel, uh, for example, um, uh, uh, DME, uh, which is a, a more of an oil-based uh, uh, product where we can actually use the current internal combustion engine, uh, or the, 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 the current combustion engines. But uh, uh, it is true that ammonia has not been researched in a way where we can say that is, we're able to uh, operate our shipping vessels on that uh, on a larger scale. It has been researched in laboratories that it's possible. I am not completely convinced that ammonia is the right way to, do, to go. There are companies like, uh, for example, Siemens Gimesa, they're actually working uh, very seriously on creating large scale production of ammonia. However, I'm not convinced whether it should be DME or ammonia. I think we still have to learn uh, more. There's a downside with ammonia, which is, um, which is that you actually need to convert uh, around 25, 30% of, of this on board to, uh, to hydrogen, which, which makes it more complex to have this, this on board use of ammonia. Uh, on the other hand, ammonia has the advantage that you don't need to have a carbon source and uh, and that can actually make it uh, somehow easier to create the fuel so um, so but there's a lot of research going on you'll also maybe some of you have heard uh, mask the big uh, uh, shipping company they are actually owned by a foundation and they have just spent uh, 60 uh, 60 million uh, euros on establishing a new center for zero emission shipping, uh, which will start uh, next, I think next month here in Copenhagen. And they have, will have around 80 researchers uh, working on uh, concepts to change the vessels and to change the fuels for transport. And they will have a lot of focus on electrofuels and I hope we will also be working with them. Thank you for your answer. Goran, you have a question? Uh, the question reads, uh, do you have any idea where the necessary investments will come from? Yeah, and then uh, also what part of the state body budget has been already used for some of these investments? That, that's, they are really, these are really good questions. And uh, I think if we, if we look at the investments needed, uh, there's not one answer for these things, but I'll try to keep it short and simple. Um, 
overall, we can say that there are additional investments needed. Um, in the Danish con context, there's a lot of areas where you would not need any public money, but you would need to make a small adjustment to the market. So um, to, to have capital uh, ready to have onshore wind or offshore wind and PV, that is private capital and it needs next to no subsidy uh, to be created. When we look at the district heating expansion, there's a whole scheme for that with publicly guaranteed loans. Uh, so that, that requires no state funding and, and these loans can be granted if there's a security in the project. The same goes for uh, geothermal and, and solar, heat, solar heating. I think there are some wild cards where we do need some public funding probably and incentives and that's to create electric fuels and to upscale the electrolysis. And uh, if we take the if we take the list here of the partially known uh, technologies, I would say some of these do require some kind of uh, public funding. There's also a pressure from pension funds to also have investments into the energy system. And I believe that these investments could be useful into industry. One of the issues with industry is actually not that we don't have the technologies to make energy efficiency or electrification. The main issue is that the payback time has to be so quick in industry and the focus is on the product of industry, which it should be. And here I think pension funds could actually create a situation where you have uh, them making the investment and, and having a longer term uh, payback on their investment. The, there's a predicament here. So even though that we can calculate here that the cost of the energy system is the same, in order to achieve that, there will be a significant change in the fiscal budget. But the socioeconomic situation is different from the fiscal budget. So we will have to have some creative politicians to change uh, the taxation if we need to uh, keep the same income for the uh, for the state uh, if that's the political wish otherwise uh, this change will create quite a large deficit on the public funding uh, because we are currently taxating things that we we won't have in the future so this requires either that you make uh, cuts in the welfare state or that you uh, have taxes elsewhere Our next question comes from Laura Benoli, University of Naples. Yeah, so what about nearly zero emission buildings in Denmark? So we have in Denmark stopped increasing the demands of, uh, uh, of our building codes because uh, what we see is an, an un, unconstructive mix in the building codes of the uh, tightening the, the demands on the uh, building envelope and then combining that with local renewable energy production. I'm completely aware that the energy efficiency in buildings directives uh, are combining uh, renewable energy on-site production with the building envelope, but this is uh, a big problem which is not going to create a cost-effective system, it's going to create a more expensive system. So in Denmark, there's a big focus on refurbishing existing buildings down to 70 to 80 kilowatt hours per square meter. And in new buildings, if they're close to district heating, they are still connected to district heating. Thank you. And I believe our next question comes from Perika Yuchik. Um, to transfer from lower generation to higher generation of district heating system, which kind of investment measures need to be done? Yeah, I think this is uh, to a very high extent. So this is, I guess, for the un, uh, let's say, uninvited into that debate. <laughs> I can just say 
I guess this question is, is about how do we lower the temperatures of the district heating grid? So currently we have a supply temperature between 75 and 85 degrees, and we would actually like to lower that to below 65 or 70 degrees. And how do we do that? Well, the short answer is it's already being done. So a lot of uh, companies are installing smart meters uh, in the areas and they are figuring out that they can actually reduce the temperature levels in different clusters of their grid. And uh, what, uh, so the investments that are needed is actually to, to start to, to understand that you can actually do some changes with the existing system. On the longer term, of course, this knowledge will mean that you, you change the type of investments you make in new pipes but that is really on the longer term. On the shorter term, it is more concerned with figuring out how to change the temperature levels. In the longer term, we can change the dimension of the pipes, but we can also change the production plants so that they uh, are actually more efficient and maybe have a lower capacity than today. And of course, this goes hand in hand with also incentives to, to insulate the buildings which I believe is not sufficient at the moment, neither in Denmark or in, in Europe. And do we have any other questions from the audience? Uh, we have one from Rodney Stewart. Yeah, so are there any plans to engage with consumers through smart meters and applications to reward them to modify their demand to coincide with renewable energy generation? So there are talks, but there are no concrete, uh, like no really concrete plans, I would say. Right now, we are seeing different electricity distribution companies are changing, changing their tariff structure so that we have uh, uh, um, an incentive not to use electricity when the electricity distribution grid is um, constrained and uh, we have a cheaper price for the grid when the grid is not constrained and i think these are the baby steps that we need to take in order to uh, engage customers uh, through the research that we have done, both on smart meters and electricity and, and heating, and, uh, and also uh, considering new demands such as EV, I think it can be important to create an incentive structure with the tariffs of distribution grids and maybe transmission combined with the electricity price on the spot market, but that that incentive is uh, driving the let's say the business the business to business uh, part of the energy system so that the consumer does not have to be concerned with this at all times i think if if we to a larger extent for example want to have evs uh, charging at the right time i think it's, it can be important that this is done in a way that consumers feel that it's easy and that they don't have to engage on a daily basis with any kind of meter or smart meter, but that they say, okay, I'm going to drive every day at six o'clock or at seven o'clock. And from when it's parked, you are fully flexible to charge it. So these kind of ideas I think will, will, will come into place gradually, but they're not there yet. And, Right now, we've we've seen two DSOs in Denmark make uh, time-dependent tariff structures, and that's so. So we're really in the early days of of of, of this. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Thanks for the answer, and we have one more question from Mani Nul Hassan. And we're ready to receive your question. Hello. Hi, Brian. This is Momenul from uh, Inuflensburg. Um, hello? Yeah. 
Hello. Yeah. Okay. The, you in one of your slide you mentioned that um, you don't need uh, V2G or G2V in the in the 2030 scenario for Denmark, and uh, this is going to be the case for other European countries. Do you think? Uh, yes, I think so, uh, because the the potential to store large amount of electricity in a vehicle is rather small compared to the potential to move around the demands that you have. Mm -hmm. So if if you imagine a situation where you can move uh, the charging of one vehicle from two from one hour to the next hour, that would be much better than to use vehicle to grid. If you imagine a situation which is not, let's say it's not a smart energy approach, it's more a sector a sector integration approach where you, where you only have electricity and gas. In that case, you will also have an expanded electricity production, or, or sorry, electricity consumption of some sort. And, and those demands that you have then uh, made in such a system will be more efficient to move around compared to having a, a vehicle to grid operate. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, there can be uh, 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 let's say uh, uh, a grid stability or, or electricity uh, quality uh, part of that where you will see that um, that in, in some let's say areas of the grid it may be nice to have some help to balance between the different phases of your grid where vehicles to grid could have some kind of, of use but this is more energy electricity quality than electricity quantity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I believe. And uh, this uh, to continue the discussion, like uh, how about the behind the meter concept um, uh, in Europe? You see, how do you see this um, in, in in smart energy system or in energy system overall? I I am very very worried about that. Uh -huh. Actually, and I think especially uh, you're from Flensburg, right? Yeah. Yeah, especially in Germany, it's a seriously bad incentive structure that mm -hmm. is that is really making the transition very expensive for the German citizens. Um, the thing is that the that all behind the meter concepts are somehow leeching on those who cannot afford to make the changes or those mm -hmm. companies who are not making any changes. Mm -hmm. um, if we take the example of a PV uh, where you have a battery in the basement, for example, and you don't want to pay the VAT or if you have an electricity tax, you don't want to pay that. Mm -hmm. You also, you don't want to pay the tariff for the distribution and the transmission grid. That in effect means that somebody else has to pay that tax or that VAT mm -hmm. uh, to society. And it also in effect means that you're not participating in paying for the distribution grid, but when it's winter mm -hmm. and when you're making your Christmas roast, you are certainly using the capacity of the electricity grid. So that is a really bad incentive structure for distributing the payment of mm -hmm. the of the system it's also problematic in the sense that if you imagine you have uh, a large quantity of households where they have a pv on the roof and batteries in the basement they will leave their home go to work use electricity at work go home and use electricity from the battery that actually means that we're keeping online power plants that could have been shut off during the day, but because you're selfish and charging <laughs> your battery, <laughs> then you're not stopping the power plant in the day. And then when you come home at night, you want to use electricity in your battery. Mm -hmm. And then you're actually using electricity at a time where prices are low or where there's a lot of wind power or renewable energy in mm -hmm. the electricity grid. So you actually increasing the integration problem on mm -hmm. the grid mm -hmm. so this is a really selfish solution and it's actually a rather expensive solution when you look at the small pv that you have put on the roof where you could have had 50 percent more if you had 
gone together with your neighbors and made a big PV on a large industrial roof. And it's also selfish in the way that you have paid so much money for a battery that is, is, is really leeching on the system. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for <laughs> the um, <laughs> wider view of these things, you know, policy point of view and the economics point of view, not only from technical point of view. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you for this extended discussion that uh, um, went well beyond the time. Uh, we have the panel next uh, in about 15 minutes and we're expecting all of you uh, to that panel. On behalf of all of us here uh, who had the pleasure of listening to uh, Brian's excellent presentation, uh, we give our um, greatest appreciation for the invited presentation. Thank you. And we all applaud uh, your excellent presentation. Thank you once again. Thank you, Sia, and thank you, everybody.